Revelation chapter 12, as we continue the chapter week on over through Revelation, we've come down to the end a couple of times, and uh, we're coming down to the end again. <clears throat> but chapter 12 is uh, a chapter that shows some stuff that goes on behind the scenes, in heaven, if you would, but um, this is not in heaven in the future, I don't think we're in heaven, it's going to actually tell us about, the, I think it ties in with where did the devil come from, that's sort of the answer as you put all this together, I think, but first of all, chapter 12, verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, that wonder in heaven was a woman, and this woman, I believe, is, is simply the church, the bride of Christ. And she's clothed with the sun. Daniel said, They that win souls will shine like the firmament. And the moon's under her feet. Upon her head's a crown of 12 stars. Everywhere we've run across 12, it's been associated with the church. So, And she, being with child, cried. Now, the one woman that you would associate that brought the child in that the devil was wanting to devour would be Mary. But I think this is, Mary would have been representative of the entire church here. She, she being with child, she cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon that had seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. I like preachers on TV draw all these charts. And that's what I said. You, you can't take Revelation completely literal or all, you just have this bunch of monsters that would be meaningless. But these things stand for something. The problem is trying to figure out what they stand for. Well, in Daniel, which seems to be associated with this passage, he talked about in the end times there would be ten kings represented by ten horns wearing ten crowns. <coughs> and out of those ten kings, there'll be a war. One will win and come up and rise above all the rest of them and then stouter than the rest of his fellows, and he becomes the Antichrist. So that's maybe these ten horns. There's something, we know this much from the verse. This is associated with the devil. There's a, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Stars of heaven is other places in the Bible representative of the angels in heaven are sometimes referred to as the morning stars sang together. You know, and uh, I'll give you, some, cast them to the earth. This, this, this red dragon that appeared in heaven, his tail drew a third of the stars from heaven. They were all cast to the earth. Now, this is so symbolic, you can't be dogmatic about anything, but I, always, I kind of bought into this years ago, and I thought that makes a little bit of sense. There's a lot of speculation on what I'm about to tell you. It's theological speculation. And the reason it's theological speculation, there just ain't enough Bible to be dogmatic about everything, but you, it, it sort of answers some questions. Like Ezekiel and Isaiah tells us a little bit about the devil. <clears throat> we found out that the devil was uh, one of God's primary angels at one time. His name was Lucifer. That was when he was a good fellow. He was the light bearer who stood in the presence of God. But in pride, he said, I will be like God. I will rise up my throne above the He was going to take over heaven. <laughs> and there was war in heaven, apparently. We find out and we put this little bit of revelation together. And if this all goes together, there was a war in heaven. And this devil got a third part of the angels in heaven on his side. Mm. And the victory was won. And the devil was cast out of heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And... He was cast down to the earth, and then he got involved in the Garden of Eden when we find him again, right? And it's been a mess ever since. And then you say, well, in Jesus' day, no, no doubt about it, every time Jesus went around the corner, there was some guy that was possessed with demons, oftentimes many demons in one person. And they haven't gone away. No. He's subtle and deceitful what we find out about the devil and his troops and some people don't believe in demons anymore but I, I don't believe they went away 
they got cast down to earth and they're, they're, they're pulling the strings. And I've said before, I always like Frank Peretti's book, uh, This Present Darkness. And he's got a sequel called Piercing the Darkness. And, and that's the way I always kind of pictured it in my mind before I even read the books. That, that uh, the theme in the books is there's a war going on, a spiritual warfare. As Paul says in Ephesians 6.12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. What we see is flesh and blood, but there's forces behind that. We wrestle against uh, demonic forces, uh, spiritual wickedness in the, in the heavenlies, in the high places. It's just uh, different principalities and powers and pecking orders of these angels and, and the fights going on. And if you read Peretti's book, it's like uh, the, evils, the evil side's often winning. But when the church gets right and the church prays and the God's people, the God's angels get strong and they're, they're winning. And in Peretti's book, you know, you see some of these, uh, these people that have problems like uh, maybe the Uvalde shooter. Peretti would have portrayed him as like if you could hit in his book and his words, you know, you get to see into the spirit realm. And you wouldn't have just seen a, an evil person going in there with a gun to kill a bunch of people you would have seen that demon that is riding his back. The stuff that we don't see. But we do know there are demons, and we do know from the Bible that there is a devil with a lot of different names. We're going to find out different names for him here in a minute. And if he drew a third part of the, de of the angels in heaven that became demons, and the speculative theological theory goes on that uh, what God's doing in salvation is replacing them because God would have made a perfect number to fill heaven to begin with. And he lost a third of the angels. He said, well, how many angels are there in heaven? We don't know. <laughs> but the theory goes on that when enough people are saved to replace that third, then the end will come. That's a lot of speculation, but I always thought it was kind of interesting. So his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and he cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman. The devil stood before the church. In this case, I think, um, because it's, Jesus is about to come through the seed of the woman, which was a prophetic way to talk about Mary back in Genesis, right? That was going to crush the head of the serpent. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered of that baby, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, we can look back and say, well, maybe that's talking about when Jesus was born, old King Herod was going to kill all the babies. And did kill a lot of them, but... Joseph and Mary being warned by an angel, a good angel in a dream, they fled into Egypt until Herod died and they came back with Jesus. So she brought forth a man child, a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's obviously messianic talk from the Old Testament. He's coming back to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God but the ascension <laughs> and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Now that certainly ain't Mary fled into the wilderness, but the woman I think represents the church once again. And in this case, it very specifically I think flashes back to where we're studying in Exodus. God rained the plagues down and the church, and by the way, some people don't realize that. They, they want to say, the Israel's not the church. Well, they were. They were God's people. If they were believers, they were considered the church because the book of Acts calls Israel the church that was in the wilderness. Amen. Mm -hmm. And when the plagues ran down and Pharaoh said, finally, don't let God's people go, where did they go? They fled into the wilderness. But... While it's a reference back to Exodus, it may be also some kind of reference to something in the future, too. Because mm -hmm. the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God. Well, we say that was Cain in the promised land of the Old Testament. But now it's here's where it breaks down with Israel. But they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. One thousand two hundred and sixty days. That we touched base on last week and said the Jewish calendar was 30 day months. Twelve of them makes 360 days. They had to adjust. We'd have to do every four years adjust for that quarter day. They had to adjust more frequently because they saw five days of the time it took the sun to go around. Five and a quarter days, actually, wasn't it? So 1,203 score days is three and a half years. Apparently the length of the tribulation period. Now some will say the tribulation period is seven years based on the math they've done with Daniel's 70th week and do the math 
and it works up right, but Daniel also said yeah. Messiah shall be cut off in the midst of the week. Can anybody tell me how long Jesus' public ministry was here on earth? Three and a half years. And the Messiah was cut off by being killed and then ascended, of course, resurrected and ascended in the midst of the week. So apparently we've got three and a half years left, and that will be shortened. Jesus said, except that be shortened, no flesh will be saved. A thousand two hundred and three score days, a woman's provided some kind of miraculous protection in the wilderness. And then uh, we go back into the heavenly scene again. There was war in heaven where Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels, the dragon's angels. Uh, and they prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. Jesus said, I saw the devil fall, cast out like lightning to the earth. And here's where we get all those names for the great dragon. That old serpent. That's what he was called in Genesis, wasn't it, in the beginning? Sure. The old serpent called the devil. He's also called Satan. And here's whatever, the, he's called all kinds of things. Eh? Old slew foot. Scratch. Mm -hmm. I get a kick out of them Hardy's billboards that's made from scratch. I'm like, I don't know if I want that devil biscuit or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep eating them. <laughs> Their place wasn't found anymore. That old servant, verse 9, he's called the devil, the Satan, which well, here's what, the, what he does. Whatever you call him, here's what he does. He's a deceiver. And he deceives the whole world. And sometimes that stuff's just obvious to me, and I don't feel like I'm smarter than anybody else, but uh, maybe I try to look at things with a biblical eye and realize that there's always deceit. The devil always wants you to look over there while the real battle's over here somewhere. And it just I hate to stick on the Uvalde shooter, but ever since that happened, all we've seen about in the world in the news is about the bad cops and the bad guns. We don't hear much about the bad guy, do we? He's deceiving. He wants you to look somewhere else. He he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I think that's the devil and his demons. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. John says, I heard this voice in heaven. It was loud. It says, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Now, when we read the book of Job, the first chapter opens with the devil before the throne in heaven. But he's already the devil because what's he already doing? He's accusing Job, right? He only worships you for what he can get, Lord. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Has the devil got anything he can accuse you before God? Because we're all sinners, right? And the picture is always like this heavenly courtroom. It's like the devil's the prosecuting attorney. You see what they did, God? <laughs> Told you there's a sinner. But then you've got your lawyer over here. The Bible says Jesus Christ, the righteous, he's our advocate, which is another word for our lawyer. And I, I can picture, you know, the devil accusing us of stuff, Christians. But the Lord's up there is, uh, uh, representing us and said, yep, that's right, he's a sinner. But he's trusting in these nail-scarred hands. Amen. That's where our hope's at, ain't it? And this chapter's going to tell us that and remind us of that before, that our hope's in, in the blood here. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Verse 11, this is it. And they, that would be the church, the one that the devil's accusing to God, they overcame him. That's worth an amen. The church overcame him. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and it, this is this verse going to say, and here's how they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb, that's by grace through faith, our sins are forgiven because of what Christ did for us. Mm -hmm. And by the word of their testimony. It's what you believe, but it's important to profess what you believe. Mm -hmm. Or as Paul writes in Romans 10, 
For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. That's all there is to it. We believe the gospel and we believe unto righteousness. We we're made righteous by what we believe. And he says, for with the heart, we believe unto righteousness, but with the mouth, salvation, or we profess our salvation. It's, it's, it's linked together right there, too. If you believe it, he said, it's important to share that, that you're a believer. You overcome them by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Did you know everybody's got a personal testimony of their salvation? Mm -hmm. Everybody's is different. You know, somebody, you know, I'm not one of these people that says, there are many roads to heaven. Well, in a way there is, but they all have to go through the cross. Amen. But we all have our different stories of how we got to the cross, don't we? Mm -hmm. And some of them are like a real exciting stuff that people were really bad and they really did a lot of dope and they murdered somebody else, but God redeemed them of all that. Well, hallelujah, he can do that, eh? Mm -hmm. But your story is just as important if your story is that Mama took me to Sunday school and I got saved when I was a little kid and I followed the Lord. That's just important too, ain't it? Yeah. And, and matter of fact, it's a little bit better because you didn't do a lot of sin before you did that, right? But they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And number three said they didn't love their lives to the death. John's always got an eye to the martyrs, don't he? And I want you to think about this for a second, too. <clears throat> Is it possible for us to make a God out of our own self? That's sort of a philosophical question, I guess. But uh, I think God gives us something inside of us to preserve our life. If you step off the curb and you realize you've stepped out in front of a 18-wheeler coming pretty fast, you don't even have to think about it, right? Instinct dives back on the sidewalk. So that's kind of a God-given sustainable thing of life that says every, every animal's usually got that. It's even, right? But yet, in John's day, the difference in the martyrs were the ones that were willing to die without denying their faith. And some rejected their faith to save their own lives. Now we could get into Calvinism and say, well, did they really ever have true faith? Or they, you know, they never were really saved or they wouldn't have ever done that to start with, all this kind of thing. But in John's eyes, it's just like, uh, well, those that would reject Christ to save their own life, there's their God, their own life. Because that was more important to them than their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, believing in the death of Christ, sustaining them, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives to the death. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, and woe or judgment to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devils come down to you. He's been running them up since he got cast out. Having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now, I have often looked at that in Jesus' day, too, that Jesus was just here for a while and the devil had a short time to try to circumvent the plan of God and unleashed everything he had toward Christ. Storms out of nowhere and people trying to stone him and everything else, right? But it's also maybe a glimpse to the end, too, that the devil's going to really unleash all his fury at the end because he knows he ain't got long left, and he knows this book, too. And that ultimately he's going to be bound and cast into the lake of fire forever and ever, right? Never to bother anybody again. Where the beast and the false prophet will be too. He knows he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. Mm -hmm. And the devil's done that since he's been down here and he's going to do it until he's bound finally. He's going to persecute the church, which brought forth the man child. Christ belongs to the church. The church belongs to Christ. And to the woman, we're given a supernatural help. Whatever this means, it looks to me like God gives the church supernatural strength here of some kind. And this is sort of, it applies to Israel fleeing Egypt, figuratively, well, on wings as eagles, and to the end time too. And remember this, when, when we read Egypt, when we read Exodus and the church is coming out of Egypt, Egypt in the Old Testament always represents the world. The, the non-Christian world, the world system. At the end, you know, the, 
find out in this book that Christians will no longer be able to participate in the world system. Because we get down to a point where it's either you deny Christ and accept the mark of the beast, whereby you can then buy or sell, or otherwise you receive Christ, refuse the mark of the beast, but you just that very act has put you out of being able to trade with the world anymore. Because you can't buy and you can't sell. <clears throat> That's when he got hunt and fish and grow garden. <laughs> Amen. And when the dragon saw he was cast, he persecuted the woman. In verse 14, And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she's nourished. Now, watch this. For a time, look at me for a minute. For a time, <coughs> singular, times, it's at least two, plural, and then a half a time. Three and a half years again, I think it's another way of saying that. And the serpent, now here once again, I watched John Hagee and them draw, draw these really fascinating charts with this big seven-headed crowned serpent, red dragon, all this stuff, and a flood of water coming out of it. And I think it was just really highly figurative. Because <laughs> the serpent, or the devil, he cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Most people who write commentaries say this is a flood of evil that's coming out into the world to destroy God's people. But the earth helped the woman. The earth is part of God's creative order, right? The devil's the one that's messed it up. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. However that happens, whatever it means, I don't know, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. But I know this that the devil wants to destroy the church and God wants to supernaturally help the church. <laughs> and the dragon was wroth with the woman. The devil's mad at the church. They went to make war with the remnant of her seed, the rest of the church that was left. And here's what I, I like it says about the church. It's easy to understand. Here's how you know the church. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now there's two things in that. One of them is simply faith. They believe in the message of Jesus Christ, but their faith calls them to act different too because they keep the, te the commandments of God. See, this 20th century stuff that cropped up that you just pray the sinner's prayer and you can live no different than the rest of the world and you've got your ticket punched to heaven, that John Calvin would spin in his grave. He never meant that with eternal security. John Calvin's eternal security, or to put it in colloquial country boy language, once saved, always saved, simply meant that if you do it right, and you really get right with God, then you're going to live right. Keeping his commandments ain't what makes us right with God. That would be a doctrine of works, and the Bible teaches against that. But all through the Bible, it talks about that, hey, if we're right with God, it's going to show up in the way that we live and act. Jesus said, my people will be known by their fruits. Here's another way of saying the same thing. The church are those that they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But because of that, they keep the commandments of God. Not flawlessly. What we endeavor to, right? Read 1 John. He talks about habitual sin versus normal everyday sin, right? It's one thing to make a mistake and ask forgiveness for it. It's another thing just to live in intentional, habitual sin. And he said the church has the testimony of Jesus Christ and they keep the commandments of God. Lord, help us to be, help that to be our badge when the rest of the world looks at us and knows we're part of the church of Jesus Christ. Not just because we say we are, but because it shows up in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.